morning, church. The scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. If you'd like to use the Blue Pew Bible in front of you, you may find the passage on page 952, 952, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And as you turn there, a word of encouragement that our God is not a God who has hidden himself, but he has shown his very heart to us through his word. Words that give us hope and eternal life. So with that, would you please rise for this reading of God's holy and inerrant word, 1 Corinthians verses 1, oh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way, You are enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, as we come before your word this morning, I ask that you would open our eyes to see the truth, the truths that you want us to see. Would you fill us with your spirit afresh and speak to us as you will? Lord, it's for your name and for your glory that we pray these things. Amen. Well, about five years ago, I was at this uh, Christian conference um, in Louisville, Kentucky known as T4G, uh, or Together for the Gospel. doesn't, no longer in existence, it's, it's had its days, and there are other conferences now, but I, I don't know if you've ever been in one of these conferences, uh, but I would say, at least for someone like me, you see someone um, get up on stage that you know well, uh, maybe a real well-known preacher, very famous, you've read his books, you've heard him speak on on the internet, you've heard his podcasts. I think it, it's, it's just, it's hard not to be starstruck just a little bit uh, when you see speakers come on stage, the likes of John Piper or Al Mohler or David Platt. Uh, that, that may just be me. Imagine being in a stadium with thousands of people all there together for the gospel. And, and at the same time, deep down, you just can't help but get a little excited about the next big-name preacher who's about to get up on stage. 
at conferences like these and even other situations, it's hard to spot someone on the streets and, and not feel a little bit enamored by the fact that you're standing pretty close to someone who's famous. Now, just for the record, I am a fan of T4G. Uh, I, I am deeply grateful for people who put on these conferences for Christians to get together and hear solid biblical teaching and are helped in their Christian walk. Um, please don't in any way hear me dogging on Christian conferences. But I do think it's good from time to time to think about and pause and wonder what exactly is driving us to be so infatuated by celebrities, even Christian celebrities? You know, in our day and age, it's a thing for people to actually want to become what's known as influencers. If you're not familiar with that term, an influencer is someone who uses social media like TikTok or Instagram, and, and, and they gain a large following. That's kind of the, the point. You gain a large following. You try to garner influence in everything from cooking to fashion to travel. You name it. Our society is so obsessed with celebrity, movie stars, sports stars, rock stars who can wow the crowds and capture both our attention and our applause. And then there's this phenomenon in the American church uh, known as the celebrity pastor. There was even this book written recently uh, called Celebrities for Jesus, How Personas, Platforms, and Prophets Are Hurting the Church. In a podcast talking about the book, the author, Caitlin Beatty, points out how easy it, is, can, it can be for churches to wrap their identities around key leaders. Maybe it's a founding pastor or someone who's made a name for himself because of the books he's written or the, different, uh, 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 the way he's gained a lot of influence through the years from different platforms. But what can happen is that when pastors or church leaders have moral failings, Christians in local churches are reluctant to hold them accountable because there's a certain reputation, there's a certain brand, there's a certain image that has to be protected. And sadly, this is a reality that's been coming up again and again in churches led by some well-known figures in recent years. So something must be off here. There's got to be something feeding our need to be associated with influential people. In the church, there's only one name that needs to be lifted up, and that's Jesus. We all know that. But how have we come so far from that? And how are we going to get back on track to making sure that Christ is the center of our attention? Well, this morning we're kicking off a new sermon series in the book of 1 Corinthians, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. And from this first section, these first 17 verses, what I want to do is to tackle these questions head on. And what I think you'll find is that the world surrounding the church in Corinth was much like what we're experiencing nowadays in modern day America. And what I think you'll also find is that we're much more like the church in Corinth than you might think. Now just to give you some background, Corinth is, is located in modern day Greece, so you think about your map, and you have Greece, you have the Mediterranean Sea, think Europe, right, Mediterranean Sea, think uh, Italy is just to the west, your west, yeah west of Greece, right? And Corinth is right there. And um, back in Paul's day, Corinth was the capital of Roman controlled, uh, a Roman-controlled province called Achaia, which uh, made up most of the southern and central um, parts of Greece. I think we can relate to a city like Corinth. It was a place where the core of city life was, as one commentator describes, trade and business and entrepreneurial pragmatism in the pursuit of success. So think Silicon Valley or even a city like ours where people strove to make it big, to make a name for themselves, to start up the next venture. One standing in society really mattered to the average Corinthian. And in Corinth, one important way to boost your place in this world was based on how well you could speak in front of public audiences. 
This was a city where people would literally travel into town and get paid to speak to large crowds. This was a city enamored by gifted celebrities and easily swayed by powerful influencers. So it's in this kind of city that Paul uh, plants a church on his second missionary journey. And in Acts 18, we learn that Paul travels from Athens to Corinth, where he meets this couple named Priscilla and Aquila. Now, this couple had just relocated from Rome to Corinth because all the Jews were kicked out of Rome by Claudius, who was the Roman emperor at that time. Paul shared a common trade with Aquila and Priscilla, and that was tent making. And they were, they were, after a period of time of ministering to the gospel, ministering the gospel to the people of Corinth, we read that many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Paul actually writes what we know as 1 Corinthians as a letter to the Corinthian church from a city called Ephesus on his third missionary journey. Now, this part can get a little confusing because there was actually a letter written before 1 Corinthians uh, that's referenced in 1 Corinthians 5.9. Apparently, after hearing an oral report and after receiving a letter from the Corinthian Christians, Paul was convinced that the church he had planted was in dire need of clarifying much confusion. So he pens this letter we know as 1 Corinthians to to respond to this troubled church. It was a church that was tolerating sexual sin within its ranks, a kind that wouldn't even be tolerated among pagans. It was a church that struggled to stay united because some thought their spiritual gifts were better than others' gifts. And it was a church that was becoming fractured because it was Uh, so enamored by celebrity. Conflict, jealousy, strife, these were all making their way into this church. And so with all that as background, let's get into our text for today. So I'm going to spend most of my time in in, um, the last part of this section, so verses 10 through 17. Um, but, But let me start off by beginning with verse 1. So, so, so look down there with me. We see a greeting, first of all, uh, written, and it says, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ and our brother Sosthenes. This Sosthenes is most likely the same Sosthenes we see in Acts 18, where um, he's the ruler of the synagogue uh, in Corinth at the time Paul was there. And as we get into this passage, I want you to notice how Jesus is so central to what Paul is thinking. If you count it up, Paul mentions Christ 14 times in just the first 17 verses. There are only three mentions of Christ in the, in, in the rest of the chapter. The word Christ shows up a total of 64 times in 1 Corinthians, which means that almost 30% of the total mentions of Christ show up in this introductory section of Paul's letter. And I think that says something about What's going on in Paul's mind? I think it says something about the centrality of Christ in Paul's mind as he addresses the Corinthians here. And in verse 2, look down there. Paul reminds the Corinthians that the church he planted among them was completely a work of God, calling them to be together as saints. They were sanctified in Christ Jesus, and they were called to be saints in order to call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was lifting up Christ at the center of it all, and no one else. So, what was the problem? Well, the problem was that the Corinthians were fractured along the lines of who they apparently followed. It wasn't as simple as, well, I'm a Christian, so of course I follow Christ. No, things were getting messy as people started acting as if they were part of just any other part of Corinthian society. Look down there, starting at verse 10 with me. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. The Greek word here for united um, is, is used in the sense of becoming ready, suitable, or equipped for a particular purpose or some use or event. You see, there's a greater purpose for unity, and that's the mission of God 
Jesus says in Mark 3, if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. So a divided church can't move forward on mission because it's so busy in fighting against itself. And what was driving this division? I want you to look down at verse 11. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is, that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or, or better yet, I, I follow Christ. Now, there are different ways to interpret uh, what's going on here, but one way to understand this is to just take Paul at his, uh, these, these words at face value. The Corinthians were dealing with a situation where there was a division along the lines of well-known personalities in the church. Well, in this case, you've got, you've got Paul, the great missionary of the early church, the infamous persecutor of Christians who had the Damascus Road experience, the author of almost half of the books of the New Testament, and then you've got Apollos, a well-spoken, eloquent man of God, a master of apologetics, who defended the faith brilliantly. And then there's Cephas, also known as Peter. You know, one of, one of Jesus' closest three disciples, a pillar in the early church, a disciple who witnessed the resurrected Christ. You see, people were associating themselves too much with particular Christian leaders, not necessarily because of theological differences, but because of the role baptism played among the Corinthians. One scholar suggests there may have been factions that developed around people um, who baptized them. Which is why Paul goes on in verse 13 to say this. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did also baptize the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. So what's happening in Corinth is that people were expressing a sort of spiritual pride in the way they made much of who baptized who and who they, who they identified with who. I'm with Paul, or I'm with Apollos. That's my man. I'm with him. You might be thinking, well, I don't, I don't feel that way about the pastor who baptized me. Well, there, there, are, are there people you know that you just like being associated with because it makes you feel good about yourself? Maybe it's a well-known preacher or favorite author or maybe it's even your own small group leader. You see, what's at the root of division in the church at Corinth lies in the hearts of humans in every age. It's this struggle to feel a need to attach ourselves to influential people in order to feel a sense of significance, to feel good about ourselves. In the podcast I talked about earlier, there's this concept of, of refracted light which can be described as the glow we get from being associated with powerful celebrity figures. Even from afar, you can feel this sense of significance when you look up to certain people. There can be a sense of superiority when you're connected to a certain figure. It just helps you feel like you've got a purpose in this world. Just, just think about the, the Calvinism versus Arminianism divide. Both schools of thought take their names from either John Calvin or Jacobus Arminius. These camps have definitely caused a lot of friction among Christians over the past centuries and on into this day. And yes, there's a place for uh, reading scripture and forming one's own convictions about how people are saved. Yes, there's a place to say, I think so-and-so the theologian put it, Probably, the way that this so-and-so theologian put it is probably most aligned with Scripture from what I can tell. But there could be really unhelpful ways to express your convictions. 
Calvinists can be known to be theological jerks. No wonder there are books out there with titles like Humble Calvinism and internet articles written like, uh, with titles like Be a Kinder Calvinist. I remember when I was first learning about Calvinism, um, more about it at least, it, it was exciting to form my own convictions about election and how, about how, how God saved people. But following this or that theologian can also become a source of spiritual pride where you look down on people who don't think the same way you do. And I think there's room in the name of Christian unity to have differences in theological convictions. Maybe it's more about whether you can love others despite these differences. Later on, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, if I have prophetic powers and understand all ministry, mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So Christian, do you see any place in your life where spiritual pride has crept in? Maybe you think you're better than someone else because you're a fan of this pastor, or you can quote that spiritual hero, or maybe you've put your sense of identity in someone who's influenced you greatly, where that person's become more of who makes you feel significant rather than Christ himself. If that's you, let this be an opportunity to repent. Some of you need to repent of the ways you've let people other than Christ himself become who you find your sense of worth in. You care more that people know you're associated with so-and-so rather than being content with simply being a follower of Christ. But other than repent, is there anything that can be done to fight against these selfish ambitions, these tendencies to make a name for ourselves or to gain something from being associated with others? How do you actually work towards killing that pride in your heart that leads you to want to be identified with gifted and influential people? Paul goes on to model what this looks like in the last verse of this passage. Um, I want you to look down there with me, verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Paul wasn't out to make a name for himself. By indicating that he was sent to preach the gospel plain and simple and without words of eloquent wisdom, he was bearing his heart. He had no intention of being a crowd pleaser. He had no intention of garnering influence. He had no intention of gaining a following for himself. He had one intention, and one intention alone, and that was to preach the gospel and let the message of the crucified Christ alone shine brightly. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, so that your faith might, not, might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see, Paul, all Paul cares about is preaching the gospel and seeing people be saved. He's not worried about who's following him. He's not anxious about how many people like him. He's not anxious uh, about making a name for himself. No, he's anxious to see people be saved through the preaching of the word and that the power of the cross of Christ be made known to this world. And, and, and this is the road to unity. If all of us, including the Corinthian Christians, would follow in Paul's example, none of us would be clamoring to be at the top. All of us would be content to serve the Lord in exactly the way he wants for us and not care a minute about if we get recognized or not. None of us will be trying to selfishly vie for power or for influence or for connections with influential leaders. All of us would be willing to, be go, to go unnoticed for the sake of the gospel. There'd be unity in the church. That's the road to unity. Not fractures based on who in the church we know 
or who in the church we're connected with. I relate to this so well. Because one of the things I've struggled with over the years is the need to be recognized. It, it might sound a little strange to you, but in the medical world, I don't really care what people think about me. But I have seen in me a very selfish and very sinful desire to be known, to be somebody in the ministry world. I still remember back in 2014, I was in the middle of residency. I was reading this book by Martin Lloyd-Jones, and in it, he writes about people who want to go into the ministry for very selfish motives. And I want to read you this, just this uh, excerpt, just so you get a flavor of the kind of words that were convicting my soul back then. It has often happened that young men with certain gifts who listen to a great preacher are captivated by him and what he's doing. They are captivated by his personality or by his eloquence. They are moved by him, and unconsciously, they begin to feel a desire to be like him and to do what he is doing. Now, that may be right or it may be quite wrong. They may only be fascinated by the glamour of preaching and attracted by the idea of addressing audiences and influencing them. All kinds of wrong and false motives may insinuate themselves. And so I wrote a journal entry on February 20th, 2014, about the state of my heart. I see in myself two competing forces at work, selfish desires and godly desires. The selfish desires within me include the following. My infatuation with the celebrity status of pastors I admire. The examples I put down were John Piper and Matt Chandler. The name recognition of various seminaries that I want to be associated with. And the idolatry of seeking my significance in ministry accomplishments. You know, looking back, I really do think that part of the reason God had me go through medical school and not go down the path of uh, pastor or missionary right after college was to help me die to my need to be recognized in the ministry world. It might sound strange to you, but I needed to learn to serve God in obscurity as a medical student and later as a doctor before I could move towards becoming a pastor and true humility. I love what Dave Harvey says about this. We need to do ministry without a claim so that we won't be claim addicts when it comes. Anonymity is the ground from which pastors are harvested. Obscurity fertilizes the man with humility so that what he grows into can really bear fruit. So what does this look like for you? Maybe you're here today and you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian. But I wonder if you can relate to this kind of constant urge to be somebody in this world. You crave name recognition. You want to be well-connected. You want to know influential people. And maybe this shows up at your workplace or at school or among your friend circles. Have you ever stopped to consider the idea that you might be looking for your sense of worth and significance in all the wrong places? You see, Christians believe that we were meant to find our greatest source of significance and worth in the God who knows us, who created us, and cares for us. We believe that being in a relationship with Jesus will satisfy all your needs to be known and to be recognized in this world because you're known and recognized by the God of this universe. But what gets in the way is, is our sin. There's this constant push against the idea that somebody else besides yourself is supposed to be in charge, is supposed to be king over your life. We want our names to be recognized. We want our achievements to multiply our influence in this world. But the Bible tells us that no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Every selfish ambition, every ulterior motive, every instance of self-glorification.
All of us are in the same boat. I'm no better than you. And all of us are headed into an eternity in hell in order to pay for the enormous debt of sin that we owe to a holy and just God. But this is why, this is exactly why the good news of Jesus Christ is such good news. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life that you should have lived, to die the death that you should have died on the cross. You see, Jesus was slain. And by his blood, he ransomed the people for God from every tribe, every people, every language, every nation. Jesus was raised to life on the third day after his crucifixion. So he's alive right now and wants to be reconciled to you. And what matters today is that you turn away from your sin and turn towards Christ. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior today. By coming to Christ, you can be free of your need to feel this, to find your sense of significance anywhere else in this world because what he thinks of you is what matters most. Christian, do you, like me, struggle with selfish ambitions? Any of you relate to my story in any level and feel sinful desires to make a name for yourself? In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis describes what meeting a truly humble person would be like. It's not that the person's always putting himself down, but what will stand out to you is how much he was truly interested in you. Lewis says this, he will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. So here's the call to action When you're mingling with others after service today or catching up with someone over lunch, begin practicing what Tim Keller calls self-forgetfulness. And be more interested in learning about the other person, asking questions and listening, truly listening, than than about getting your own thoughts listened to. I think the more and more you live like this, the more you'll die day after day to your need to be somebody, to be recognized, to make a name for yourself. And as you practice self-forgetfulness, I want to leave you all with with this this motto of sorts that's really helped me over the years in my fight against selfish ambition. It's based on a book written by Patrick Fung, and it goes like this. Live to be forgotten so that Christ might be remembered. Live to be forgotten so that Christ might be remembered. Let's die to the need for people to remember us. Let's be about the glory of Christ alone. And let's be willing to live in obscurity for the sake of the gospel. Live to be forgotten, so that Christ might be remembered. Father, You know our hearts. You know just how much we crave recognition in this world. But walking in the way of your law, Lord, we wait for you. Your name and your renown are the desire of our hearts. Make that so today. And by the power of your spirit, would you free us from needing to make a name for ourselves? And instead, free us to live out your purposes for our lives, to serve you in the ways you call us to, even if nobody remembers us. Help us to be willing to live in obscurity for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.